little housekeeping. It is good to be present with you this morning here at uh, First Congregational and to bring you greetings from the national setting of the United Church of Christ, from our staff, our leaders, uh, and from the board. It is truly an honor, and as I mentioned in the earlier service, to not have to get on a plane this weekend to preach, but to be able to get in the car and drive two hours um, to be present with you. It's a joy to know that you are here in Columbus doing ministry as the United Church of Christ, First Congregational United Church of Christ. It is a blessing. I want to thank you for your years of financial support of the Heartland Conference and of the national ministries through the special mission offerings. You have consistently given to our church's wider mission, to one great hour of sharing, to the Strength in the Church offering, and to Neighbors in Need and the Christmas offering. Our vision for a just world for all cannot be accomplished by any one of us. Instead, our collective witness contributes to changing lives and to changing the world. Thank you. <laughs> That's allowed. It is good to be here with you this morning, and you are moving through a time of transition and celebration and thanksgiving and new beginnings. I want to say congratulations to Reverend Tim as he is in the process of concluding his ministry and retires after 25 years of leadership here with you and in Columbus and 40 years of ministry in the United Church of Christ. You are also celebrating your 172nd anniversary as a congregation. Come on now. That is huge. Um, there is a history of social engagement that should be celebrated among you with all that you have done here in Columbus and with the ways that you have contributed to the church and impacted the wider church through your ministry and through your contributions to what we do around the world in mission and ministry with our partners. Through your contributions to wider church ministries and what we do, you too are a part of our engagement with over 290 partners in over 90 countries globally. We celebrate you in this moment. So thank you for your presence on behalf of so many. Thank you for your witness in the community. Thank you for being a safe place where God's love is experienced and the good news of the gospel is lived in fullness. And while you have a lot to celebrate and can point to a legacy of community involvement, this is a time of celebration and it is not an end. It is actually a place of new vision and new beginnings for you as a congregation. So we give God thanks and praise for you. I also want to acknowledge my colleagues and my brothers and my friends. Stand up and give the people a wave. <laughs> Reverend Lucien Washington and Reverend Charles Watterson are here and we are grateful. We were actually down in Cincinnati for the Open and Affirming Coalition, so we've been road warriors this weekend, but I know they're no strangers to you, so um, thank you for being here this morning. Just want to acknowledge your presence. Let us pray. God, for this time, we are thankful for the presence and power of your Holy Spirit poured out and revealed among us. We are grateful. You are God who speaks to us in a variety of ways and God who is still speaking. And we pray, O oh God, in this moment, O oh God, that you will speak to our hearts. And we pray mostly, O oh God, that the words of our mouths and the meditations of all our hearts will be acceptable to you, O oh God, our strength and our redeemer, and let the church say amen. amen. As mentioned, I'm a poet, and so I have two poems for you this morning. I only gave one this morning in the earlier service because, you know, it's 9 o'clock. At 11, you get more. 
you might be a little special. It's just a shorter service. Broken sidewalks. Now, when I'm finished with the poem, I'm going to snap my finger. Now, what that means is that you know that the, the, the poem is done. But in the tradition of poets, if you choose to snap your fingers, it's an acknowledgment of the poem in that as well. We inhabitants of time and space, children of lesser gods, brothers and sisters of light, relatives of saints and sinners. We, wounded travelers building magical moving staircases to fantastical dreams, traumatized healers mending breaches and fissures. Then as now we rise, then as now we hear the drumbeats of tomorrow. Then, as now we chart a future singing songs without a score, then is now. We, the transcendent children of the earth, babies formed from tears, visionaries writing on the clouds. We, the mystery of life, living as seeds fallen into the cracks of broken sidewalks, finding soil, pushing deep, shattering concrete. Then, as now, we flourish. Then, as now, we hold tight to each other. Then, as now, we chant incantations, weaving strength and hope into broadcloth of justice without looms. We, waters flowing free, children of breath, bearers of courage, luminaries of change, marching across broken sidewalks. We, creators of tranquility, children of radiant brilliance, defying obstacles, sidesteppers of defeat, building pathways to our destiny. Then, as now, we transmogrify. Then, as now, we swim rivers to generational healing. Then, as now, we dream afloat, riding flotsam, rearranging shards, of broken sidewalk into sweeping mosaics of freedom. We are living through particularly challenging times. And when have we not? These times which call us to respond to what we see present around us. There are local and global challenges, social ills and dis-ease which command our attention and demand that we respond with compassion and care to those around us. A reasonable response to what we see is not always easy. A balanced response means that we not only think about what we want to do and how we want to respond, but that instead, we are invited to meet people where they are as we address their needs. It is easy, you see, to project what we think or how we believe others should exist in this world unto others. Our desires ought not to border on judgment, but ought to emerge from a place of justice and compassion. The world continues to change around us. The inevitability of change is a truth that we sometimes try to avoid, desiring instead to cling to the certainties that we know. Change can be good, people. The transformation that we seek in body, mind, and spirit, the embrace of change that signals better in our world is always and should always be welcome. That is not always the case. We live in a world where people do not respond with love as they should. We, witness, we are witnesses to phobias, which are based on hatred and distrust of those who do not look like us, think like us, or subscribe to the same beliefs that we do. And here in the United States in these times, we find ourselves tiptoeing through another election cycle, 
where vitriolic language and behavior is on display. What do we have to say into the uncivil discourse that is present among us? How do we hold true to our morals and values while respecting the rights of all people? Challenges are all around us and we account for those living on the streets, unable to feed themselves and their families. Here in Columbus, the homeless population is on the rise, as it is in many of our cities. And as schools reopen this fall for another year, many of our children are returning to school in the mornings hungry. Our schools are in economic crisis with challenges that prevent teachers from having the materials and the supplies that they need to educate our next generation. What does this mean for us in this moment? And in all of this, there is the church. Followers of Jesus Christ who are at odds with each other in presenting a God of love and a Jesus of justice. This is not the first time in history that we have seen the church divided. The visionaries who founded this church did so as supporters of the abolitionist movement. This church was the locus for the formation of the social justice movement, which was needed then and is still alive and well among us and is needed for this age and for the age to come. In the words of sweet honey in the rock, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. In the Gospel of Mark this morning, Jesus asked his disciples why were they arguing among themselves and what were they arguing about as they traveled from Galilee over to Capernaum? Here in chapter 9, we experience the fullness of Jesus' ministry and the wonder of the disciples as they witnessed his interactions with the people. What could they have been arguing about in the midst of this time of transformation of people's lives and the community in which they lived? I'm only going to tell you the chapter 9 part. The disciples were a little petty if you read the text. As the, at the beginning of the chapter, they were with Jesus when he went up the mountain and was transfigured before them. Jesus was revealed to them in a new way and with him were Moses and Elijah who appeared on the mountain with him. Peter's desire was to stay there on the mountain to build three shelters for Jesus, for Moses and Elijah. And the text says, he did not know what to say for they were terrified. Jesus was teaching them in a new way, interpreting for them the teachings of the scribes for the times that they were living in. He was healing the sick. And in Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, verses 14 through 29, it tells the story of Jesus healing the boy with a spirit. In that passage, Jesus asks a similar question of the disciples who he found arguing with the scribes and a gathering crowd. What are you arguing about with them, he asks in Mark chapter 9 verse 16. In this case, the man stepped forward and indicated that he brought his son to the disciples for healing. According to the man's account, he said, I asked your disciples to cast out the spirit, but they could not do so. Their failure to respond to the need of the child produced the argument that they were in when the crowd with the crowd and the scribes. Jesus responded by healing the boy, something they were unable to do. 
It is after all of this occurs that they move on and Jesus asks them the question. It was after they, their failure to do what they were supposed to do that they were arguing about which one of them was the greatest. Let's be clear. After all they had witnessed, their egos needed to be fed with the simplicity of perceived greatness. Rather than drawing closer to the divine, they thought their ability to heal was coming from themselves. Rather than drawing closer to God and being filled with the spirit, they were transaction, uh, transacting their positional power with Jesus. And rather than drawing closer to the divine, they allowed their egos to overshadow the work of the spirit present among them. As I travel across the United States visiting our, visiting our congregations, I hear ongoing conversations about the church. What is the church doing? Is the church relevant in these days? What is the message the church has to bring? What does the numerical decline facing many congregations mean for the future of the church? Is there a future for the church? In the midst of it all, we have turned inward, looking at ourselves and wondering who is the greatest among us. And yet, I would say that is not our task never has been and never will be. Like the disciples, the focus on ourselves and what we think we can do is problematic to our ability to be responsive to the needs of those around us. Their inability to heal the man's son was a bright product of this misguided competitive attitude which caused them to experience the manifestation of God working in them, among them, and through them as a sign of their own greatness, a failure of their faith. Church, we are here for a purpose. We are here present as witnesses to God at work in the world. We are a part of the vision, invited to be agents of social change. Each one of us brings gifts and skills, a vision for mission and ministry that allows us to do the work of justice. The prophet Micah says, he has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. It's simple, do justice, love mercy, walk humbly. Each one of those I would point out to you is a complete sentence. The walking humbly part was missed by the disciples in that moment. Jesus' lesson to them is about humility. He said to them, whoever wants to be first must be last and servant of all. This is a formula for walking humbly. Jesus applies simplicity to helping them understand what they needed to be responsive to the needs of those who were sick and brokenhearted to the wounded who were among them. Our humility is also needed for this moment. A humility that draws us closer to God for the living of these days. We cannot be responsive to the emerging needs in the community and in the world if we are not centered in God and connected to the power of the Holy Spirit looking outward and away from ourselves. Ministry and mission and the message that we bring require a vision that is beyond us. The history of this church is replete with the stories of people who loved God, embraced risk, and accomplished far more than even they thought possible. Those ancestors who came before us understood the promise of the Spirit. And I believe that they lived in Pentecost 
and the coming of the Spirit as a daily part of their lives and not just as an annual event to be celebrated. We have the option and the possibility to draw closer to God. Our commitments to spiritual practices, to living God revealed, moves us beyond the shallowness of believing that we can do anything by ourselves in the church. We can do more, we're called to do more, we need to do more, and we can be more deeply spiritually connected as we let go of ourselves and allow the presence of God and the power of the Holy Spirit to guide us in the days that are yet ahead. Then as now, we have the opportunity to be living witnesses to the healing power of Jesus revealed among us. There is so much more for us to do. Let us draw closer and stop the arguments about trivialities. Let us draw closer and witness the freshness of the spirit poured out among us over and over and over again. Let us draw closer and see God at work in this day, in the church, every single day of the week. It is time for us to draw closer so that we can live into being the prophets and the healers of this day. May it be so for today, for tomorrow, and for generations to come. And let the church say amen.